Police on Merseyside searching for missing two-year-old James Bulger have discovered a child's body. In February 1993, Britain was shocked by the abduction and murder of a Liverpool toddler, James Bulger. Poor James only went missing from his mother for a matter of seconds and he'd gone. The shock turned to disbelief when it had emerged that James had been brutally murdered by two ten-year-old boys, Robert Thompson and John Venables. There were angry scenes at their trial. They were eventually found guilty and ordered to be detained in custody. I do remember the judge at the time saying it was such an evil act that they, they carried out and they're going to go down for a very, very long time. But 17 years later, the case was suddenly back in the headlines. That John Venables is back in prison tonight after breaching the terms of his release. Today we can report that age 27, he's been charged with possessing indecent images of children. Albert Kirby was the detective who helped catch James Bulger's killers. Since John Venables' arrest, he's felt compelled to find out what went wrong. Did the system that was meant to rehabilitate him fail? And how should we deal with young children who commit very serious crimes? If we believe that adults can be rehabilitated, surely we have to believe it for children. I remember early on that Friday being told the little boy had gone missing in the shopping precinct in Bootle. I was then head of the serious crime squad in Liverpool. We all thought, first of all, he was a little boy who'd just gone wandered off and, and got lost. But within hours, the police discovered CCTV pictures of two boys with James. They later identified them as John Venables and Robert Thompson and plotted every inch of the route they took with James. They brought James out of that entrance there. They then went down the slipway and actually onto the canal the CCTV cameras on that building with the black shutters, they were the cameras that actually caught them walking up here. And they were seen taking all this route. If they hadn't have wanted to hurt James when they came out of the passageway here, all they had to do was to cross over the road and walk that short distance to the police station entrance, and even if they just abandoned him there. Instead, the boys took James off the road and through an alleyway. And they took him up along the wall, up onto the railway line, and then once they were up there, they were out of the sight of anybody, and they weren't going to be disturbed. Two days later, a child's body was found by four boys playing close to the railway line. When I was told that a body had been found, we all appreciated um, uh, who it was going to be. I've seen many murders, I've dealt with many murders, but I've never ever seen the extent of the injuries that were inflicted on someone who was basically totally incapable because of his age in actually defending him. And I suppose you could say it was a degree of humiliation which is outside the realms of anyone's imagination. But I think we were all numbed, to be quite honest, by actually what we'd seen. You couldn't really think in your own mind when you saw what had happened at, at the actual scene of the murder, that the per person who was responsible for that was a child. But that picture was building up and we thought, we have now got to prepare ourselves that actually those two young boys that took James uh, were responsible for causing his death. The 
Four days later, a tip-off led them to arrest Venables and Thompson. They were both just ten years old. The boys were taken to separate police stations where they gave a total of 20 interviews over three days. You're under caution and you do not have to say anything unless you wish to do so, but anything you say may be given in evidence. Now you understand that, don't you, John? Yeah. All right. I have a photograph here, which is a video camera photograph. That to me, that's me. So the boy holding James's hand is you. Yeah. And the boy ahead of you in the in the dark jacket and trousers, Robert, Robert Thompson. And what was it you told us? Cool, James. Right. Now, I know that took a lot of doing. I can't tell you anything else. Why? That's the worst bit. Why? Okay, right. I know that's the worst bit, but you know what you did. Right. Think about it. Right. And just tell us what happened. You took my reel and shot and started throwing bricks at him. And then. Who, who did? Robbie. Why did he throw bricks at him? No. Where did the stick? Where did the stones and the bar hit him? In the head. Was he bleeding? Oh, Where was he bleeding from? Face. Then it was Robert's idea to kill him. Okay. Is it finished now because I can't speak anymore? You have to look upon both boys uh, quite separately. In Venable's case, uh, in the interview, he was quite emotional. Um, he was subject to breaking down. His activities in the interview room were quite bizarre in so much he'd get up, he'd walk round, and he'd throw himself at one of the detectives for comfort and support. In Thompson's case, he was completely different. He was streetwise well above the age of 10. In his interview, Thompson blamed John Venables for the killing. He hit him where exactly? In the face. In the face. I think he hit him in the eyes. And he hit him in the eyes. Right. Now, was James making any noises then? He was knocked out. He was knocked out. Was he moving at all? The trial sparked a huge public outcry. Bastard! With many branding the boys as evil. The judge took the unusual step of allowing them to be identified. So the whole country soon knew their names and faces. After a trial lasting 17 days, the jury found them guilty of murder. They knew full well that what they were doing was not only wrong, it was seriously wrong. And it wasn't as if it was a childish prank that had gone wrong. The intention was to cause death, to commit murder. The criminal justice system had dealt with James Bolger's killers. The public could only hope such a barbaric crime would never be repeated. But on Saturday, April the 4th, 2009, a nine-year-old boy was found wandering and covered in blood on a street in Edlington, near Doncaster. He and another young boy had been the victims of a furious assault carried out by two children. Despite his injuries, he managed to say that his friend was seriously injured and needed urgent help. A search was launched to find him. I, mean, I suppose it's just purely by chance that I decided to walk down here, why? Sergeant Richard Vernon was the first to stumble on the scene. What did you first see then? The first thing I saw was a young lad, partially clothed, face down and on a muddy riverbank, um, covered in blood and motionless. It was a cold day like today, and seeing a, a blood-covered motionless body, you think, is, is this lad any longer alive? 
So he was lying there with his feet in the water then, and whereabouts yeah, was he was the laid, part of his He body? was laid upwards up the bank with his hands like that and his head to one side on the riverbank. It was immediate, obviously, he got a serious um, head injury, a, a wound yeah, to the back yeah. of his head that appeared very deep. He was in and out of consciousness. There was a lot of blood on his face and the back of his head. Um, he kept closing his eyes and opening his eyes again. I've been in this in the job for over 22 years and I've never seen um, somebody um, that's still alive with yeah. injuries as horrific as that, and especially yeah. on a child of that age, no, yeah. never. Senior detective Mick Mason led the investigation into the Edlington attacks. He discovered that two brothers, aged 10 and 11, had strangled, burned, and sexually assaulted the two friends in a terrifying, unprovoked attack, lasting an hour and a half. They'd filmed part of it on a mobile phone. There must have been a stage whereby they were very close to actually committing the full offence of murder. Why do you think that your two offenders actually left them at that stage and didn't fulfil the ultimate act of killing? I think one of the offenders uh, had become tired during the attack. I think he'd physically worn himself out attacking well, that's these two young lads. That, that's and, hard to believe that, isn't it? But physically, he'd worn himself out and I think he'd physically had enough of inflicting the beating. And I think the lads did actually say that the reason they stopped, they were exhausted. That's and, and, and when you think about that, that's horrendous, isn't it? And that, yeah, when that came yeah. to my team's attention, it's a horrendous thought that this lad's not been beaten to death purely because the offender's yeah. tired. And what I found quite problematic was that you'd got the, the, the extent of the injuries, the extent of the violence, and yeah. you've got two young offenders, two young victims who have been horribly, horribly attacked. And it just makes the investigation so problematic yeah. that these lads knew what they'd done, yeah. knew what they were doing. Though the brothers were not yet in their teens, they already had an extensive history of violent offending, including assault and battery. They kill some ducklings by throwing them against a tree and had tried to burn down Joy Silcott's cafe when she refused to sell them cigarettes. And he turned like a Jekyll and Hyde. He, he went red in the face, he called me some terrible names and he really turned nasty. They'd been in all the bins in the park, got all the rubbish and built it up at the back door right next to the gas pipe. It was the older of the two boys got the younger boy to light it. If they'd have left it, it had just gone up, which had just gone. The boy's antisocial behaviour was escalating and neighbours began to gather evidence, here filming them throwing stones at houses. The family were well known to social services and just three weeks before the assault, the boys were moved into foster care in Edlington, where they were nicknamed the Mini Cray Twins. The, the family were, were quite dysfunctional. Uh, the, the parenting mm. skills that they possessed were, were, were nil, really. So the lads hadn't been brought up very well. It's been a violent background, a violent history in their family. What, violence within the family, within the family or directed environment. towards them? Well, they, they were, it was certainly from a, a violence within the family environment, if you like, and also crime within the, within the family as well. I found them quite cold and... Just disinterested. Just really. disinterested. Yeah. There are hundreds of child offenders in Britain, and there are clear patterns in their backgrounds. One study suggested that three quarters of them came from a broken home, a third had been in care, and one in five had a low IQ. One of Albert Kirby's first jobs on the James Bolger case was to investigate the backgrounds of the boys charged with the murder. When we looked at the history of the two boys, there were suggestions that 
Venables had been the subject of bullying at school. In fact, one of those that were bullying him at one period of time uh, was Thompson. But they became friends, and we know certainly the year up to the, before the murder, they were regular truants from school, always coming out and being involved in petty shoplifting, that type of thing. In the Venables case, mother and father uh, were separated, but had had joint care for the children. Robert Thompson's upbringing seemed more difficult. There is a history within the family of violence. Seven children, a big age span. Oldest one's been arrested, been, been to court, been in the care of the social services. Father who abandoned the family, just totally dysfunctional. Journalist David James Smith attended Thompson and Venable's trial in 1993. It sparked an interest which led him to write a book about the case and spend years researching the boys' backgrounds. So I always thought that, that John was the one who was quite sly and devious. And, you know, I think uh, his family background is not as normal as uh, people like to think. I think certainly there were difficulties with his parents. I think they had separated. I think his mother had issues with depression. And he himself at school gave lots of concern to teachers by some of his stranger behaviour. I, I have no truck with those who uh, say that you know, those two boys were born evil or, or you could look in their eyes and see evil. Uh, I absolutely you know, refuse to accept that, that evil exists in that way. But you said that evilness doesn't exist, but didn't you think from what came out in court and from what you found over the years that there may have been evidence to actually support that yes, it does exist with those two? Uh, well, Albert, we'd have to agree uh, to differ about that because uh, I just, uh, uh, I do not believe in that concept of evil. I mean, I think you can, I'm, I'm willing to accept you could describe the act as evil, but if you start to look at the reasons why and how it happened, then uh, I don't think you'll find the answer in the Bible, but I think you'll find the answer in their family backgrounds. Dr. Peter Mish is a consultant psychiatrist who specialises in working with children who commit serious offences. He says the reasons for such terrible crimes are far more deep and complex than most people think. There are no generalities. Um, the, the kind of children I may see may range from children coming from absolutely normal, loving, caring family backgrounds to children who have been subjected to neglect, abuse, throughout their childhood, and in a sense, one wouldn't be particularly surprised that they commit serious crimes. Two children were taken away tonight to be locked up indefinitely after they were convicted of the murder of two-year-old James Bulger. The judge said the killing was an act of unparalleled evil and brutality, and they should be detained for very, very many years to come. But after a delay of five days, the court announced that Venables and Thompson were to serve a minimum of eight years in custody, a sentence that disappointed Albert Kirby. Remember quite clearly that there was consideration being given to both boys being sentenced to 15 years in imprisonment. And eventually, it ended up as eight. But I personally always believe that the tariff of eight was really far, far too low. For James Bolger's mother, Denise Fergus, that didn't feel like justice. I felt let down. I felt like James had been let down in a big way. I thought, you know, this is just not good enough. Because at the end of the day, they, they killed a baby. He didn't deserve to die the way they killed him. He didn't deserve to die at all. But they done that to him. For the hundreds of juveniles convicted of serious crimes in Britain every year, Custody often means a secure children's home. There are 10 of these in Britain. They're designed to house those guilty of offences ranging from burglary to murder, as well as vulnerable children sent there for their own protection. In 1993, John Venables was sent to this one on Merseyside. One of the managers there at the time was Pam Hibbert. Secure children's homes are what they say, they're secure. So they have bars, they have locks. 
staff have keys, children are locked in and out. What we endeavoured to do was to put the emphasis on the children's home bit rather than the secure bit. Care and control. And I think that's really important. And it's not control in terms of physical control, but actually controlling children by the relationships that staff have with them. That's really important. This is Orchard Lodge, the last secure children's home in London. Before it closed in 2009, it ran a very similar regime to Red Bank, where John Venables was held. Dennis Scotland was its director for a year and a half. Secure Children's Home is based on um, ensuring that there's, there's clear structure and order to that young person's life from the day they arrive to the day they leave. They have a clear sense about what's expected of them. And I know that many, many children, unfortunately, come from an environment where they don't have much structure. And I think that that creates chaos in a, in a young person. A child needs to know who's responsible, who's in charge. And we think that those values, those principles, will enable them to be better people when they leave here. You're here with us now, you may not like it, but this is how it is, order and structure. Rebecca spent four months in a secure unit when she was 14. She got into trouble with the police after a difficult childhood and was sent to the home for her own safety. When I first got there, I remember like they were showing me around, all right, yeah, this is where you eat. And then they said, this is yourself. I looked around it and it, it wasn't sinking in. It was all happening too quick. And the door just banged. So I sat down. I felt like I really could cry. But then I just kept looking around the room and then I just didn't cry. And then that was it. I think that was just my little emotional part of it and that was it. Everything's just a strict routine. You don't have a choice in anything. The staff there are all over everything. There's about, what, 20 doors in one hallway and they all have to be swiped with a little card that all the members of staff have. So it's not like you could just walk around because you couldn't. You had to be with someone at all times in order to get through one door, to get through the other, to get through the other. It definitely felt like a prison because at uh, the cells, for one, everything's stuck to the floor. You cannot pick up anything. And obviously in your own bedroom at home, you would be able to move your furniture if you wanted to. So it was definitely like a cell. The window itself isn't glass, it's like loads and loads of layers of plastic. And you, it's just so hard to see out of the window itself, so we wouldn't really class it as one. There's two members of staff that I did get on with like really, really well. And that was only because like, they, they respected us, they showed respect to us, so we respected them. It wasn't just me, it was like everyone. You could, you could always see when that person entered the room, we wouldn't kick off and we wouldn't act up or anything. We wouldn't do none of that because it's just purely out of respect for them. John Venables started life at Red Bank under a false name. This was meant to protect him from unwelcome questions. He had difficulty settling in even threatening on one occasion to batter a member of staff's baby. It's something that takes not months but years yeah. of really intensive work. And I would suggest the younger the child when they commit the offence, the longer it takes. The realisation that you have done something mm. awful and you're going to have to live with that forever, it is never ever going to go away. All children held in secure units are given an individual treatment plan. Their psychological needs are assessed and many receive intense therapy, intended to make them acknowledge what they've done wrong. Actually, acknowledging their own responsibility, and that's a really big hammer blow to children. I did this, I really did this. Mm. I did something horrendous that is vilified by the world. It's a big thing. And you have to be very tough with them and not let them make excuses. That's really important. The emphasis here is not on punishment. 
the aim is to rehabilitate its young residents within the confines of a secure setting and to prepare them for release. Yes, you get the media stories, don't you, about, you know, their holiday camps, they have play stations. But the law in this country says that the deprivation of your liberty is the punishment. Not something extra we do once you're inside, but actually being deprived of your liberty is the punishment. Um, and I think, you know, an expectation that then people are going to be in chains and live on bread and water is perhaps wrong. But for the families of victims, the secure unit regime can often seem too lenient. As the years were going on, I was learning about how they were getting treated in there. They were getting given the best of everything. They, they picked wallpaper to go on the walls and every game that come out on the market, they, they were getting given. So I thought, you know, where's the punishment in this? I just felt so let down by it all. Secure children's homes try to strike a balance between punishment and rehabilitation. But do they get it right? It costs £215,000 a year to keep a child in a home like this. But there are no statistics on reoffending rates from secure units, so it's impossible to tell if they're successful or not. I think what we learnt is really how strong the foundations of secure units are. The way that they, they treat these young offenders, the way they try to rebuild their lives and give them standards in their life that they've never had before. And I think that has been very enlightening. The problem, I'm happy, is not within the secure units. It works in the secure units. I think in John Venable's case, the problems arose when he got outside. Killers of James Bulger are to be freed. Eight years after they were jailed, the Home Secretary announced that John Venables and Robert Thompson will be released on what's known as a life license. They'll be under supervision for the rest of their lives and could be rearrested at any time if they're thought to be a risk to the public. In 2001, the authorities decided that Venables and Thompson were ready to be released. An official report drawn up by health professionals directly involved in their care said both had made exceptional progress. They'd never been violent, had worked hard at their studies, and had considerable achievements to their credit. The risk of them reoffending, the experts said, was low. Albert Kirby disagreed. John Venables had no experience of life as a, as a teenager and as a young adult outside. I think when you look and what we've learned, it raises big questions as to whether it was a matter that John Venables will be released or whether he should actually be retained in custody but perhaps in some other location. And I think that's a key part that we've learned uh, looking at the whole aspects of secure units. So I seriously question the assessments that were made that he was ready to make that transition at 18 years of age. This the first sign of outrage in Liverpool, a convoy of lorries passing James Bulger's grave at the lead his mother Denise. In a statement she said the killers were evil and shouldn't have been released. I just felt so let down, I thought, you know, why are they getting released after what they've done? You know, that they should be spending more time. They should go on to an adult prison, not getting released. It's too early to release them. I thought, no, this is not right. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to bide my time because one day one of them are going to end up, or both of them are going to end up back in an adult prison because they are going to reoffend. Just eight years after he murdered James Bolger, John Venables was released on a life license, which imposed strict conditions on what he could and couldn't do on the outside. He had to be of good conduct. He was forbidden from contacting the family of James Bolger and from going back to Merseyside without permission. Any infringement would immediately lead to him being locked up again. Albert Kirby wasn't optimistic. I'd hoped that they were capable of being rehabilitated, but I never had the faith in the system where I believed that they could have achieved that by the time they were 18 years of age. And I shared the belief that they should have gone into prison as a warning to them 
that if ever they did break the conditions of their parole, that was where they were going to end up. As Venables prepared for freedom, there were real concerns that he might be targeted in a revenge attack for James Bolger's murder. So he was given a secret new identity, which the media were expressly forbidden to reveal. He had his own sort of network of probation officers and uh, he had to have this whole identity created for him with false documents, with a passport, a GCSE certificates, a national insurance number, everything that created a, a background for him. And even to the extent of what was called a legacy lie, a story that he could tell people to make him convincing as in this false identity. And the pressure of that, I think, must be huge. It must be really difficult to actually have to have a new identity. As an 18, 19 year old, striking out on your own for the first time, also having that big secret hanging over you, I would imagine makes it more stressful. To begin with, it all looked so promising and so rosy. He had a flat, he, uh, he was able to find a job, he enrolled in college. Um, he even had a girlfriend, all the reports are very positive, he's being monitored constantly, has a, a huge support from the probation service. The court injunction protecting John Venable's identity severely restricts what can be reported about him since his release. But we have spoken in detail to one of his friends, who first met him in 2002, shortly after his release. We've used the voice of an actor to protect his identity. Well, he was shy at first, obviously. I got all of him, like, basically straight away. I had similar interests, music, sport and that. Just hit it off from there, really. He was a nice lad, do you know what I mean? It was great to get on with, a good laugh, basically. I mean, no one spoke a bad word of him. For five years, Venables had weekly meetings with his probation officer and steered clear of any trouble. He's being monitored on such a regular basis. Uh, and uh, uh, because it's going so well, they start to, uh, to, to uh, downgrade the supervision and uh, I think that he lost a lot of the support that he'd had. By January 2006, his life seemed stable. He had a full-time job, he stopped seeing his psychiatrist and his meetings with his probation officer were reduced to once every three weeks. Everything was going smoothly but it was about to go downhill. He was rejected from a management training scheme and forced to end a relationship because his girlfriend had a child. In 2008, at the age of 26, he was again in trouble with the police. He was arrested for a scuffle outside a nightclub and uh, in fact the, the charges are dropped uh, and then shortly after that he's arrested for possession of a small amount of cocaine. Later admits that he's been using cocaine quite regularly and also taking this uh, drug Meow Meow, this drug Mephedrone. His friends also witnessed his developing drug habit. He started off with tablets if I remember rightly and they'd be into poppers as well and then weeks, months down the line he was into cocaine and all that stuff. It was like an addiction in the end. Got it out, lined it up, taken it before, and then after work, he'd go home, do another one, before he went out on a night out. And I was like, why are you doing that? And he goes, basically, mate, it blocks out things sometimes I just don't want to think about. All through that period that he was out, there was this constant fear of being discovered. He was afraid. He was afraid of being found out. He was afraid of you know, being the victim of, of, of some revenge attack. After his arrest for fighting and the evidence of drug abuse, his supervision was stepped up again. He was told to meet his probation officer every week. He was also placed on a curfew and had to stay at home from 11 o'clock at night until 6.30 in the morning. But for Albert, this intervention came too late. We know there was close supervision with him which would perhaps help him in some way of feeling secure because there was always someone there who he could turn to. Someone who could tell him like his life inside, how to run his life. And instead of that supervision and contact 
slipping away and being eased off, that is the period when we know now that um, John Venables became vulnerable. His behaviour went out of control and there wasn't the, the, the mechanism there, the system there, that he felt that he could go to and feel happy with. That cannot be acceptable. Venable's spiral of decline continued. Though it was strictly forbidden under the terms of his licence, he started going back into Merseyside, close to the scene of James Bolger's murder. He goes back to watch Everton matches and he goes to see uh, concerts. If he'd been found out to be doing those things, he would have been recalled to prison immediately. And uh, arguably, he should have been recalled to prison. But he wasn't. And after one late night drinking session with his friends, Venables finally cracked. Despite all the efforts to protect him from exposure, he started to reveal his true identity. We went out, he was like himself, normal. Talking about the obvious football, music, and roughly about half 11, one o'clock in the morning when he's more gone, he was like, got something to tell you. He said, do you remember that little kid in Liverpool that got killed in the train tracks? So I was just like, yeah, why, what about it? He said, I've got something to confess, that, that was me. I said, behave yourself. And he just goes, yeah, all right. But for some reason that stuck in my mind. But four weeks later, having a drink, doing the same thing as normal, got to like two, three in the morning. He said it to me again. So I just laughed it off again. Must have been some kind of release valve where he just had enough and he couldn't carry on, basically. Two weeks later, I heard from other people say he put him for references because he wanted to leave the job and work somewhere else. I went round his anyway and it was like completely empty. I was just like, where the hell's he gone? Like he just uplifted and disappeared somewhere. He reports to his probation officer that his identity, he believes, has been disclosed. They call the police, the police come round and find him hacking at a computer to get the hard drive out or to destroy the hard drive. They take the computer and they find on it all these uh, quite grotesque messages of child pornography. Venables was found to have 102 indecent images of children on his computer, some depicting the rape of children as young as two years old. He was immediately recalled to prison and later convicted on pornography charges. He was jailed for two years. John Venables, one of the two killers of the toddler James Bulger, has been sentenced to two years in prison for downloading child pornography. James Bulger's mother, Denise, said the sentence was too short and that justice still hadn't been done. Did it come as a shock to you when you were eventually told that Venables had been re-arrested and was then back in custody? Well, they've always believed that they'd go on to re-offend and that's been proven with Venables. So I was just praying that he didn't hurt anyone else. That's all that was going through my mind, to so just hope no one else has suffered at his hands. So what did go wrong? Did the attempt to rehabilitate him simply not work? And was he really prepared for life outside? Venables himself blamed the pressure of living under the constant fear of reprisals and with a false identity for his reoffending. John Venables had been taught to lie and become very good at it, so when he had things that perhaps he shouldn't have been doing that he wanted to conceal, then he was able to do that. How on earth can someone who's murdered and is then introduced to a false identity actually handle that? I think it's very, very difficult to actually expect somebody to live a lie on the back of what they've done. In January 2010, the two Edlington brothers were sentenced to serve at least five years for what the judge called a sadistic crime against two other children. They're now going through the same system of rehabilitation as the one that some believed failed John Venables. But with one major difference. As they have never been publicly named, they won't need new identities when they are eventually released. I am pleased that they haven't been named because I think that is, is one less added difficulty uh, for their reintegration into life uh, as adults. 
But I, I hope that the two boys that inflict the injuries on them, I hope they don't get treated the way Thompson and Venables got treated. The way. I think we should learn from the past, you know, that it doesn't work giving them the best of everything. It doesn't work rehabilitating them. It doesn't work spending a lot of money on them. In many parts of the United States, the authorities share Denise Fergus's skepticism about the value of rehabilitation. Here, the focus is on long-term punishment. In August 1993, just six months after the murder of James Bolger, a similar case shook America. 13-year-old Eric Smith was accused of killing and abusing four-year-old Derek Roby. County Court is now in session. The Honorable Donald G. Purple Jr. presiding. He's about that tall. He weighed 40 pounds. He lived four years and 10 months. And that person killed him. Eric Smith choked and battered the young life out of Derek Roby. That day, Derek had left his house to play at a sports field 200 yards away. He was never seen alive again. So you find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree? Yes. Is that unanimous? Yes. You may be seated. Take the young man in custody. The 13-year-old was jailed for a minimum of nine years, but a maximum of life. Eric Smith spent eight years in juvenile detention. But then, instead of being freed, he was transferred to a high-security adult prison. And he's still there today, 18 years after committing the crime. Derek Roby's family insist he shouldn't be freed. I know I killed Derek, and you know, like I said before, I'm sorry, I am. And there's not a day that goes by in some way, shape, or form, that I'm like forced to remember what I did. Regardless of what labels they give me, doesn't mean that that's what I am. You can label me a monster, a cold-blooded killer, a demon child, Satan incarnate. I don't care what the name you give me, doesn't mean that that's who I am. Since 2002, Eric Smith has appealed four times to the parole board to be released. Each time, it was rejected. There is no guarantee he will ever be released. John Venables could be back on the streets as early as July 2011, though it will be up to the parole board to decide if he's ready. He will remain on a life license and his name will be added to the sex offenders register. While there's no suggestion that Robert Thompson has reoffended, Venable's release is likely to reignite the passionate debate on how Britain should deal with children who commit violent crimes. What do we want to do with these children who do commit very serious offences? Now, some people would say, well, you should lock them up and throw away the key. But if we believe that adults can be rehabilitated, surely we have to believe it for children. Surely we have to believe that children who do something awful at a very young age, at the beginning of their development, with the right treatment, can be helped to develop in a way that will make sure they never do anything like that again. Albert feels a unique set of factors led to Venables reoffending. Some created by the system itself. You can never have a system that's 100% perfect. But what we can learn from John Venables is the areas where they become vulnerable in early adulthood, where they've failed to come to terms with what they've done, make the adjustments to living outside, and also living under a false identity, a lie should be seriously considered when they're looking towards the future of other young people who are placed in a similar position. <laughs>